Here we further study the measurable functions and this time we will look at the objects or oh, in fact we will look at the measurable function as a all of them together as a single object and we will have a name for that so I will use this notation L0 fx fm where this is a measure space as defined in my previous video this will be the collection of all measurable functions and now this video will, sh uh, will prove the following result that actually, well, well, the one which I will call theorem, that the collection will not, and I will sometimes abbreviate uh, this by dropping this bracket if there is no any ambiguity. So the collection will not, the collection of all measurable functions is, is algebra. Uh, and uh, here's the explanation what I mean by that. If I have two elements of this, so if I have two measurable functions from this or not, then I have a bunch of things I can say about these two functions. For instance, the sum of these two functions will be measurable. The scalar multiple of these two functions will be measurables for any lambda. These two alone actually shows that, actually, you know, that the collection of all measurable functions is a linear space. But on the top of that, we also can say that the product of two measurable functions will be measurable function. And that concludes the statement that it is an algebra. But theorem actually has the fourth part, which also says that if extra I have a sequence of measurable functions such that pointwise limit of such of these functions exist, if I have a pointwise limit in every point of your universal set X, then the limit, this pointwise limit, will also be measurable. So in fact, L0 is the algebra which is closed on the pointwise convergence given that functions converge. So I have a proof for that. Uh, part 1, look at this. You know, part 1 is based on the following identities between sets. Here it is. I claim that uh, the set where f plus g bigger than c can be represented as a countable union across all rational numbers such that f bigger than rational number r and g bigger than c take r. Let us see why we have such an identity. Uh, one side embedding is easy. I mean, if you have an element from the right hand side, so an element x or point x such that f bigger than r and g bigger than c take r, just adding up these two inequalities gives us this inequality. That's why we have the left hand side. Uh, the other way a little bit more involved, so I'll give more details on that one. If I start with the element in the left hand side, which by definition now it means that f of x plus g of x in this element bigger than c, I can now alter this inequality to such like so. Uh, next, because this number, it's a number bigger than this number, strictly bigger, because of the density property of rationals, I can produce a rational which in between these two numbers, like this. Now if I now interpret these two inequalities individually, I will then have that on one side we have f of x bigger than r, and on the other side, if you solve the other inequality, the second one for g, you have g of x bigger than c take r, which in fact means that x belongs to one of these intersections for this chosen r. So we have x belongs to the right hand side. And that establishes the opposite embedding. These two embeddings together ensures the identity. And now we have this. This is a measurable set. This is a measurable set. The countable union of measurable sets is a measurable set. And that finishes the proof that the f plus g is a measurable function. Second one, second statement, uh, is actually the proof of the second statement uh, is, uh, is having two parts. First part is the special case when lambda is equal to zero, in which case your function is just identical zero. And that's something I didn't mention, but I hope, I mean, I'll leave it for you to check this. Uh, constant functions, they are measurable all the time. So in particular, zero function, constant zero function is measurable. In case lambda is non zero, we have to argue differently. We have to actually mention something like this that the set lambda f less than c can be written like so, and we do have the ability to do that because lambda is non-zero now, and this is a measurable set because f was originally measurable. 
<coughs> and that finishes the proof of part two. Uh, I won't be giving the proof of part three, in fact, because it resembles a lot part one. I will leave it for you to figure this out. You have to, although, carefully count for those possibilities when one of the factors is equal to zero. But apart from that, it resembles a lot the part one. Uh, and that's it will be a good exercise if you try to recover the missing details for the part three. Uh, for the part four, actually, I will give the proof. And uh, in fact, I will insist on the following identity that the set like this, f big and c, is in fact can be given as the following representation. Or if you remember our lim inf and lim soup definitions for sets, it will be lim inf for the sets like this. Uh, again, I will give some argument for that. I mean, if you believe this identity, then the part 4 is done because individually each set here measurable, so the countable intersection countable union is also measurable, and that's why f is measurable. Uh, but we have to, of course, see this identity, and that's the way how we see it. We start from the, well, I decided to start from the right hand side first. By, the, by our earlier interpretation of the lim inf construct, we know that this means that x belongs to every set here starting from some point. So that's what is said here. We have an n such that fn of x bigger than c for every little n bigger than n. That's a literate interpretation of lim inf we did with you very long time ago, in fact. Uh, now, using the properties of the limits, if you have a numerical sequence which is bigger than some number c for all n starting from, that, from some point, then the limit of such sequence will also be bigger than this c, given that the limit exists. But we here, we have the assumption the limit exists, bigger than c. And that's direct interpretation of the fact that x belongs to left-hand side. And now, all I have to observe is that each implication here is reversible. If you have x on the left-hand side, then you have this observation. Now, a limit being strictly bigger to some, be strictly bigger than some number c, it just means that there is an n such that every element in your sequence bigger than c after that n. So this is reversible, and that's just the interpretation of the lim inf we discovered with the earlier. So this one is also reversible, and that finishes the proof. Modular missing argument for part three, which I hope you can recover independently.